microphone up good? Okay, perfect. Um, Jim, you're officially the king of ambivalent hand symbols. Because there was like thumbs up and then wait. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, now I think you're just messing with me. Uh, I, one housekeeping item that I want to mention, we do have uh, some cypherpunk love, no photos buttons. So if you don't want to be in a photo, um, please grab one of those buttons from the front desk. Um, if you see someone wearing one of those buttons, please don't take and post their photo. That's it, <laughs> super simple. Um, I'd like to welcome out our panelists uh, who are joining us tonight. So just come on out, grab a microphone, grab a seat. Uh, this is a topic that I'm really excited about because even as a compliance nerd, I don't know all of the things about everything. So I am, uh, I am really excited to talk about this because it's something where I think I'm going to learn a lot. My theory about meetups is that I just bring a bunch of people together who are way smarter than me, know lots more about a subject matter um, than I do, and then we have a conversation. So I'm really excited to have this crew here tonight. In terms of uh, just, just some quick preamble, um, I want to be sensitive to the fact that we do have two software companies here. They are competitors, although we all love each other. Um, so they're not going to be giving detailed demos. Please don't ask them about their specific algorithms or things that might be very proprietary. Um, and if, if you ask those types of questions, they're happy to provide that, but they will do it not on camera after you sign an NDA. <laughs> so uh, by way of introduction, uh, we have Andrew Coral, who's from Blockchain Intelligence Group. Uh, we have Adam Goldman from Bitbuy. Uh, we have Dina Mainville from CypherTrace. Uh, and we have Giles Dixon from Grant Thornton. And can everybody just take a, a quick minute and say a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why cryptocurrency is interesting to you? Uh, so my name is Andrew Coral. Uh, I'm from Blockchain Intelligence Group. Uh, and my I'm probably the least intelligent person on this panel. My background is uh, law enforcement. I was in uh, federal and state law enforcement in the United States. Um, most recently, I worked for the Drug Enforcement Administration as an intelligence analyst. Um, and wouldn't you know it, people are buying and selling drugs on the dark web using cryptocurrency. So when I was with uh, the DEA, I was put on that unit. Um, and that's when I became very interested in crypto. Um, and, and that's where I'm coming from. My name is uh, Adam Goldman. I'm the president and founder of BitBuy.ca, one of Canada's uh, top exchanges. And uh, basically, I'm I'm into cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and blockchains uh, for many ideological reasons as to what they can do for us um, as we ever ever so interact on a on digital platforms in our everyday lives consistently um, so I believe that there's a lot of big power there I believe it's very disruptive and uh, I couldn't be happier to be involved in a, in a, in a space that's growing and evolving and uh, that's it uh, my name is Dina Mainville I lead sales for CypherTrace so the jurisdictions that I cover are Bermuda Canada and all of the Caribbean um, my background before this was working in IT, so I've been in the blockchain space specifically since early 2016. I've been in IT for six years. Um, and I think what got me interested in the technology is probably um, the more social impact, you know, not just cryptocurrencies specifically, but blockchain in general. Um, with respect to cryptocurrencies, I'm really excited about its ability to close socioeconomic gaps. I think probably the more interesting use cases are outside of the Western world, but um, I think we'll start here for now. Uh, last but not least, hi, I'm Giles Dixon. Um, I work at Grant Thornton just down the road in the financial crime, AML, forensic practice. I've been with the firm for a few years now. Um, I've you know, generally specialized in financial services, but over the last couple of years been increasingly working in the crypto space, providing those types of services. Um, I first became interested in cryptocurrency purely from a personal perspective. Um, I moved over to Canada a couple of years ago as you can, from the UK, as you might be able to tell from my accent. Um, and in the process of doing that, I needed to transfer some money across from my UK bank to my new shiny Canadian bank. And um, I was surprised at how, how, not only how long the process took, but how expensive it was in all the fees and all that sort of thing. Um, and I thought, you know, there had to be a better way. And I'd heard at the time about this thing called Bitcoin and, and you know, the rest they say is history. And I, I got involved and sort of buy, bought some, tried doing a transfer and, and you know, that it took off from there really. And then I've been fortunate enough now to transfer that over to my professional uh, life as well. 
Um, and I'm Amber Scott. I'm the founder and chief AML ninja at Outlier Solutions. I became involved in cryptocurrency purely by accident. Um, so, so I don't pretend to have any prescience there. Um, back in 2013, a friend of mine asked me to update their risk assessment. And they were doing a lot of processing for a Bitcoin exchange. Um, and I said, I don't know a lot about that. I read about it in Wired. I've never used it. Can you pay my retainer in Bitcoin? Because I don't get things unless I play with it. Um, it it's probably appropriate that we're, we're either at or just past Bitcoin Pizza Day. Um, because everyone always says, you know, did you keep the Bitcoin that you got at the time? No, I had to transact. I had to understand how it worked. Um, although now I wish I had. Um, but I bought a tablet that I promptly left on an airplane. So... Um, <laughs> That was a good choice. <laughs> good thing you didn't buy a pizza for $80 million. Fair. Well, I mean, it wasn't $80 million I at know, the time. I uh, so starting from there, um, I want to say through, throughout this, um, we're going to be dealing with some complex subject matter. No one gets it right away. That's absolutely OK. Um, if you have questions, throw up your hand. If you're online and you have a question, Rodney will be monitoring the chat. Uh, so please do feel free to type in questions. And I want to start with just a general question. Um, can you give me a high-level overview of the tools that are available and what problems they're solving right now? All right, well, I'll start. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Blockchain Intelligence Group and what we have to offer. Uh, we have four main offerings. Uh, the first one is a combined, what we're calling a compliance suite. Uh, it's Clue and BitRank. Clue is our forensic trace track monitor case management system uh, for uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum cases. Uh, and BitRank is our uh, risk scoring uh, system for financial institutions and compliance officers. Um, BitRank scores are baked all into to Clue. Um, so that's our main software offering. The other things that we bring to the table are uh, CryptoInvestigatorTraining.com. It's an eight-hour training course. You can cut, up, cut it up into, I think, three or four different parts. Um, and you can do that online. Uh, it was put together by Rob Whitaker, our director of uh, forensics and investigations, uh, law enforcement experience, as well as Teresa Anaya. Uh, she comes from the AML and compliance division. So two of the top experts in their fields came together and, uh, and put together this course. So that's something that we have to offer. Um, we also have in-person training. Myself, Rob, Teresa can fly to wherever you need us to do it. And we'll give uh, four hours to a two-day training course uh, to whoever needs it. Um, and finally, we have uh, what we call the Crypto Fusion Center. Uh, and that is, um, it's in its infancy, but it's a community of, uh, we're trying to get together law enforcement and compliance officers and exchanges uh, to come together. And when, com uh, when exchanges um, are hacked, God forbid, or something happens, they're able to propagate that information almost immediately to the network. People get notified um, so that hopefully um, discourages people from trying to, you know, cash out. So that's what we have to offer. Um, and then on the Cypher Trace side, um, a little bit similar. So our first product is a cryptocurrency investigation and compliance console. So it's a software that you access via a browser. You can actually go in and run traces on cryptocurrency transactions that will return risk scores, information about um, the geographical location, the entity that completed the transaction. So that's the first thing, it's the forensics tool. Um, the second thing that we do is uh, we provide an API. So for um, clients like exchanges who are doing high volume transactions, they can programmatically query us um, when they're receiving Bitcoin or sending Bitcoin out. Same for ETH. Um, we also have monitoring tools. So these are essentially, uh, they kind of function like a searchlight that you can shine onto a crypto business. So they would be useful for regulators that are looking to monitor the businesses within their jurisdictions. Uh, they're used by banks who are looking to provide financial or to provide financial services to crypto businesses and need to understand their relative risk. And then they would be used by exchanges who want to show their bank or show their regulator that they're being compliant. So it's basically um, a weekly report that is done for our clients based on who they want us to monitor. Um, the third thing that we do is consulting. All of our training is done through that division as well. Uh, anytime clients need white papers, so we've been getting a lot of inquiries about things like Bitcoin liquidity, uh, market manipulation, all of those custom requests are done through consulting. I'm glad that I have some music for this. Thank some you. Music. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> that's it. so that's the division that handles training as well. We have a Cypher Trace certified examiner course, on-site workshops, and then lastly, a new package that we've been offering is our bank threat intel. Um, so we have a pretty good story about a bank in the U.S. We asked them what their crypto exposure was. They estimated it to be 25 million, and then after running our database, they actually found it was over a billion. So that's a big space that we're getting into as well. Sure, I can uh, I can jump in on this a little bit. Um, so so my view is more from the exchange operator side. So uh, a company like ours is uh, is a perfect candidate to be able to use the different tool suites from different companies. Um, and uh, we use a whole host of things. Most of them are third party. If they are. Um, you know, very intensive at looking at and historically gathering large databases of information that we would like to cross-reference our own information against. Um, but we've also had to do a lot of uh, custom and proprietary work just simply to show us other views of, of the existing data that we currently have in our system. Um, so, you know, things just basically off the top of my head would be, you know, duplicate um, duplicate pieces of information, IP uh, IP information in duplicate or, or variances in the proximity versus a registered address or a login location. Um, we monitor uh, pretty much everything on the network stack that we can in order to determine the validity of a, of a true actor. Um, so a lot of the times we're able to see whether somebody's using a VoIP number um, that they wish to get rid of after they've transacted on a platform, uh, which, which obviously presents a challenge in order to go after such a person. Um, there's also um, there's also uh, obviously leveraging platforms and tools like uh, CypherTrace, for example, where you can really have deep insights into the crypto flowing in and out of your platform. And, um, you know, a lot of things that are typically flagged, I noticed, uh, may not necessarily be illicit activity, but it really gives you a good window into the type of uh, customer base that you should be serving or looking to serve. Um, there's really... Uh, uh, in, a, in a world of laws, and I was just mentioning this uh, in a conversation earlier, you know, there's no sense sort of swimming up that stream. And at Bitbuy, we aim to be fully compliant, fully above board, uh, been in this space for about five and a half years, and have delivered uh, every single Bitcoin uh, that was purchased. Um, and now with these great tool sets, as regulation is around the corner, we're really able to sort of legitimize what we do and try to provide peace of mind, comfort on the security and compliance side to both our banking and financial partners and the end users themselves. Uh, I guess the, the only thing I'll add to that, you know, so I, again, coming at it to a slightly different angle to the rest of the panelists here. So, you know, working with different clients, um, whether it be from a, an AML perspective or, or forensic, where we're, you know, trying to trace cryptocurrency that's been lost or stolen, for example. Um, you know, the thing that these tools really are, are, well, one of the very good things that these tools do is they help us to take what's, you know, if you spend any time in compliance, you'll have heard the term risk-based approach. Um, it allows, you know, companies to um, focus in on where the risk may exist within their organization because, uh, you know, AML compliance can be very expensive, time-consuming, resource-intensive undertakings. So to have a tool um, like Cybertrace, like Big, and any of the others that can sort of um, shine a light, to use the, the analogy, which was quite nice, um, on sort of where some of that risk sits, you know, where some of that risky activity, where the coin has come from, where it's gone to, can really help you to focus your efforts on, on where the risk is and, and sort of manage your time and your resources effectively, which is a huge, uh, huge benefit for companies looking to comply and do all the right things from an money anti-money laundering perspective. Awesome. So I, I think that actually answers um, the second question I had, which talked about uh, really just how these tools are helping to complement existing AML tools. So I want to um, skip over that. There's a concept that comes up um, which is attribution. So can you tell me a little bit about how that pertains to these tools? Where do you get the information? So just broadly, not asking for any secret sauce, um, but where are you getting the information that allows you to give a risk rating to a Bitcoin address, for example? Um, so when I flash you my QR code, how do you know if that's a shady address or not? Um, <laughs> So, uh, so there, I mean, every company is going to use proprietary mechanisms to get this type of information, but I think it's important to kind of at least speak at a high level. Um, so when I 
met Cypher Trace, I didn't believe that they could do this stuff. And I know Bitcoin at a technical level, and that's kind of why I was like, this, there's no way that this is happening. So I think it's important to to sort of explain, at least at a, a bird's eye view, what's going on here. Um, so some of the ways in which uh, companies like ours collect attribution, and, and when we say attribution, um, if has anyone here seen a, a publicly available blockchain tool like a block explorer? Some people? Okay. Lots of people. Good. Good. Um, for those of you who haven't, uh, it's, it's your distributed ledger, right? It's the thing that you can log into and you can see that an event has happened on date X at time Y and you see two alphanumeric addresses and you see a hash and it doesn't make a ton of sense for most people. Um, it doesn't tell you the nature of the transaction. It doesn't tell you anything about the profiles of the, the people or the entities that have you know, participated in that transaction. So when we talk about attribution data, when we're talking about blockchain analytics tools, it's information that helps you understand the nature of the transaction. So things like, you know, was it, was the Bitcoin that I received from a dark market vendor? Was it from a criminal entity? Did it come from a Bitcoin ETM? Did it come from another exchange? That's attribution. Um, IP address information is attribution. Uh, geographical location is attribution. So all of these types of like the extra data pieces, the things that help you make a decision about whether or not you want to be dealing with that transaction, that's what we are in the, the business of providing. We're data companies essentially. So how do we get it? Um, one of the, the mechanisms that we use is by setting up on exchanges. So CypherTrace has accounts on over 400 exchanges globally. So we actually go into those exchanges, we document the health of their KYC processes because that's something that clients wanna know. Do I need an email address or do I need a passport? How long does it take? How much money can I transact? That's information that we wanna know and relay back to you. Um, and then what we do is we run transactions through those exchanges and we put that data into several different types of machine learning algorithms. Another mechanism that we use in the case of, let's say, ransomware um, is actually infecting ourselves with the ransomware. So we set up things called honeypots. We get ourselves infected, we get the pain address, and then machine learning and AI does magic for us. Um, Stop for a second and just course. explain what ransomware is. Yeah, does someone else want to take a turn? I'll take a stab at it. Um, so ransomware is effectively a virus that will take over your computer, uh, lock and encrypt the whole computer, and prevent you from accessing your files uh, unless you pay the ransom. And the ransom is 99% uh, of the time requesting Bitcoin, obviously, uh, for the purposes of us mentioning this year. Um, and so it's very interesting, just in, a, in our own experience, uh, we've noticed in talking with law enforcement and talking with lawyers and regulators and the victims themselves, um, that the the criminals who are using ransomware are aptly pricing their ransom at a threshold that's almost uh, not enough for any type of law enforcement action. And then when it gets to sort of a legal recommendation from a lawyer, their advice is usually to pay it. Um, now, that presents a problem when uh, you know a particular person representing a client who's been a victim of ransomware comes onto an exchange like ours and, and lets us know uh, what they're doing. Um, so that's been a very interesting slope to climb uh, as to whether or not we're actually facilitating um, the, the ransomware. Uh, but if it's if there's a law enforcement and a legal determination made that you know you really don't have a choice, then that kind of has some leeway on the issue. But it's a very sticky subject, and uh, it's something that has plagued even entire city computer networks. I think as recently as uh, a week or two ago, um, a county a county office in the, the United States, maybe Chicago, I want to say. I, I can't remember exactly. Baltimore, city of Baltimore, police computer network, uh, several hospitals. Several hospitals and, you know, it's aptly priced that uh, it depends how, how much you want to spend on trying to decrypt an encrypted key. That's a very hard task to do, and um, I'm, I'm sure our friends from the DEA could even comment on that. <laughs> I was just going to say, it's uh, most of the ransomware we're still seeing is is usually Bitcoin because it's the most user friendly, and, and folks who, uh, if it's elderly who, who they don't know even they can barely turn on their computer, but they get this ransomware, they're like, okay, I I think I can figure out how to get Bitcoin. Whereas if it's some other privacy coin, forget about it. So, uh, vast majority of ransomware is still today in Bitcoin. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, so some of the other mechanisms that we would use, um, I know CypherTrace specifically, uh, we are 
well connected with the law enforcement community. So we add attribution at a rate of about 1.6 million pieces of data a week. So you can imagine that is quite a lot. About 5% of that comes from official partnerships with law enforcement. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll give it over to you. You can share some secrets too. I think maybe if I could just interject on one thing, um, one of the ways too that any organization will start to figure out what types of indicators to look for is, you know, Google is your friend in this instance, and a simple Google search can reveal a lot of uh, what they call OS int, open source intelligence, and you can find addresses posted in the comments of subreddits or Reddit threads or YouTube videos or things like that. Um, and you know, garnering all that data just adds to the set of indicators and, and flags that you can you can use or these lovely companies that are producing these tool suites for us to combat this fraud and this illicit activity. And maybe I would just add something to that. Um, and then I promise I'll give the mic. Um, a recent stat came up that I think is very applicable to this. Um, we are very, very critical of open source intelligence because it has come to our attention that about 40% of what's out there um, is actually false positive. So I would say use it, it's at your disposal. Just err on the side of caution, maybe have a secondary resource to be able to back up that, that data. Uh, in terms of attribution, I would echo a lot of what Dina said. It's free to sign up for exchanges and you get a wealth of information uh, from KYC to doing the micropayments and then using machine learning and, and AI to, um, and heuristic clustering to kind of um, understand the network better and then make the connections that you need to do. Maybe I could just ask, how, what percentage of the, say the Bitcoin blockchain do you have attribution on right now? It's a popular question. <laughs> First guy to say a number loses. Yeah, I don't. I, <laughs> so, okay, so so maybe um, maybe we'll preface it um, by saying it's very important to quantify and qualify uh, what you mean by those questions, and it, it's tough because some companies out there will say, okay, we've indexed every single Bitcoin transaction, which we all have. It's on open source ledgers. We can all see that. Um, so you can't say you've you've attributed 100% of the blockchain because that's. I mean, you ha if you have, then you're as good as the next publicly available tool. Some companies will say, okay, uh, we're counting direct transactions and then one step out and we're calling that attribution. So it's at least for CypherTrace, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. I could throw out stats, but they're not gonna mean much unless we have a discussion about what specifically we mean. I also will not answer the question with a number, um, but, but it, like Dina said, it's, it's all about um, you know, what you, you're already aware of and then one to two hops out um, and then, you know, always keeping up to date with, with um, the community and new uh, exchanges that are coming out, new darknet markets and, and things like that. So um, you can never really get 100% of it um, attributed accurately. Giles, we're supposed to help each other. By the way, I, I, I should say I use CypherTrace and it's great. And, you know, the attribution is definitely there and there's a lot of it. So I would just preface that. Yes, uh, uh, we have a question. Joseph Ayuso, Chief Anti-Money Laundering Officer at BitBuy. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I got a silly question, and uh, I sort of know what it means, but I don't know if everybody in the audience mean, knows what it means. When you talk about attributes, what do you mean by attributes? Like, what kind of attributes are you talking about? I'm going to impress my Camlo here and take a stab at this. Um, so, so I guess attributes, I think I would like to associate with uh, with the word indicator. Um, and so every data point that you can look at uh, in your business, everything on the KYC side, everything on the KYT side, which would be knowing your transaction, which would be um, this group right here, um, every single data point uh, is an indicator. And each indicator obviously needs to be given a certain amount of weight, as Dina was kind of alluding to earlier. And so um, Basically, the attribution that you give something could be a summation of how much weight you've given to particular indicators that you've looked at in a particular scenario, right? So I may notice that a particular user has irregular login patterns based on IPs and using a VPN and proxy. Um, now, that may or may not be nefarious, and I need to continue to look at other indicators in order to give myself sort of full attribution on uh, what the risk exposure is with this particular uh, person or entity that I'm trying to evaluate. Is that right? Um, so I was looking for a little bit more about Damn it. <laughs> that, that, that's the beginning, but I was looking for more of the, because I've seen this in the top population, but more of like, like when you go one, two hops, Yeah, 
Yeah, no, oh, I, no that's, a, that, I think that's we okay. Were, can we get a microphone for when folks have questions? Yeah. Um, just, to, just to make sure. Can you repeat that? Oh, yeah. Online? Yeah, no Thank problem. You. Yeah, I think we were just kind of, um, uh, we were kind of just talking about that uh, loosely a minute ago where, uh, you know, we may be using one of these uh, tools and a particular transaction gets flagged with a certain amount of risk exposure for a dark market, but then upon Absolutely. a further analysis of some sort of forensic tracing, uh, you know, I see it's five or six hops away from the destination that my infrastructure sent it to. And so it's really hard to tell at a certain point as you, as you go down the chain, if you will, uh, if the person that transacted on my platform is the same person who's transacting a few hops away from the transaction. So that's uh, kind of a, a, a challenge. For, What's for, a hop? Sorry? What's a hop? Uh, I was actually going to uh, address that. So a hop is simply, uh, le le uh, I mean, I may not be the best person to give a definition for this, but a hop is essentially, uh, you know, A to B, that would be one hop, all right? And then down the line C, that would be two hops away from the originating transaction. So that's kind of how we look at it. And, you know, on, on BitBuy, we may have a customer who withdraws one hop to a wallet they control. It may be a brand new address that they created on a free wallet service. Um, and then from there, they can send it to maybe a mixing service. And then from there, it goes to a dark net marketplace. And so that flow eventually has risk exposure associated with it, but it may or may not be the actual participant that we interacted with on our side of the hop, if you will. It's also important to look at exchanges and way where they're headquartered um, and the regulatory environment in those countries. That can have an impact on the, the risk score uh, that you're looking at for a, a particular address or wallet. I think we have a question in the back. Um, oh, just, just for because we have folks online, if we could, that would be great. Um, you mentioned the concept of clustering. Um, when an address is in a cluster, um, what made that address in that cluster? Um, that's the first thing. And if we are clustering addresses, does it differ from one provider to the other? Or if we ran the address on one service, it would yield the same exact uh, results on the second service? So, so I, don't, I don't think, in terms of the way that um, the algorithms work in the background, it, w it would never give exactly the same result um, unless they were using exactly the same algorithm, um, which we would, we would never know. Um, I, I think it would be very, very rare for someone to be running, you know, several of these services. Um, but in terms of the question of clustering itself, is that something that you feel? So um, I, I think if I get this right, um, my understanding of, of clustered addresses actually have to do with a, with a type of protocol that addresses addressing, let's say, for Bitcoin itself. Um, so basically what, what can happen is, is become familiar with the term that you have a wallet, and then inside your wallet, you can have many addresses. And if you're on newer versions of uh, more modern implementations of current blockchain projects, um, so for example, I I'm gonna use the word SegWit uh, in the context of Bitcoin, and that was an upgrade to the network as to how many um, addresses you could pack into a particular block, thus uh, making the network hypothetically faster. And so with, uh, with uh, the event of a fork occurring where an upgrade like that occurs, there was also something to do with the way wallets and addresses were created. And so there's something known as HD wallets or, hierarchical, or hierarchically deterministic wallets. And when you set up your master node or a master wallet, um, you can actually create as many addresses as you want and they will belong to that particular HD cluster. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's more or less uh, what you were referring to? That's a good way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, so, so the cluster is basically like you've got the bank and inside the bank there's tons of accounts. And so traditionally when you open in a, ba a bank, you know, there's a good, the bank has a good paper trail on what, be what belongs to it. That's my attempt at answering that. <laughs> so then I guess the question becomes, are, are you able to determine that an address belongs to a particular cluster? Um, traditionally, uh, yes. So, so uh, usually the master public key of any particular HD wallet um, will actually associate its clustered addresses with it, and that's just basically by technological design of how that that HD uh, system works. Fair. 
And that's actually a pretty good lead into the next question that I had, um, which was that we hear about a number of things that are happening from a privacy perspective. And so you have things like tumblers, you have things like mixers, which are a place where um, these coins can be mixed together in an attempt to make them harder to trace. Uh, you hear about specific wallets that are actually designed to make it more difficult to trace. Um, and we hear about privacy-specific coins. How do these things affect the ability to use blockchain analysis tools? Uh, it makes it very difficult. If, if it's not a public blockchain, then it's incredibly difficult to actually pull that data. Um, in terms of regulation and compliance, our organization standpoint is that if you're dealing with um, you know the problematic blockchains like uh, Monero, Zcash, Dash, Verge, um, it's not it, it, you're not being compliant, um, and we kind of want to see uh, these organizations um, kind of shy away from those or, or not uh, accept them. But um, to answer your question, yeah, it's very hard to to look at those blockchains uh, publicly. What you could do is uh, potentially trace a Bitcoin. Say they started with Bitcoin. You could trace that to um, atomic swap friendly exchanges. Atomic swap is going from Bitcoin or Ethereum to a different um, altcoin, so to speak. Um, what you could do is look at, you know, Changely, uh, Coin Switch. We have over 227,000 coin switch addresses identified, and you could say, okay, they went from Bitcoin to this privacy coin, um, you know, and, and go from there. But you could trace it to the point of saying it actually went from Bitcoin to a particular privacy coin. Uh, not necessarily. You could say it went from Bitcoin to this exchange, Changely, Coin Switch. Um, what's the other one? Uh, Bitbuy does not yeah. offer Monero or Zcash. There you go. Any of those coins. So you, disclaimer. You, you couldn't say it, it definitely went to this altcoin, but it's a good indicator. Okay, so, so that it went to one of those exchanges. So an exchange like Gemini that offers Zcash is not compliant? I wouldn't say that. Uh, Comment. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. No, it, we just, uh, we prefer the, the more friendly, you know, um, open source blockchain. Listen, if, it, if you're dealing with these privacy type coins um, and you want to be a part of uh, the broader network of financial institutions, it's tough to say, I want everything hidden. You have to have some element of KYC, KYT. So, um, and that comes with you know, Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. So one of, one of the comments I, I will add just about Zcash and Monero is uh, they do actually have something called an audit key. Um, which is available within those protocols so that if you wanted to do, um, if, you, if I held a bunch of uh, Zcash or Monero and you wanted to audit that and actually be able to look at that, um, you could be granted access to do that. So, uh, from the holder. So, so while they are pri privacy intensive protocols, um, there, there are ways to look at those, but you ha they have to, the holder has to be willing to open up and provide that access. I think on Gemini, it, uh, it's open. Like, you don't hide the address. Right. Well, well, Gemini is a, is a, I guess, a, a regulated and compliant exchange, and so, I think when you sort of walk through the door onto Gemini, even if you're looking to get into the privacy coins, they're, they're collecting the paper trail, at least for your entry into such a coin. Um, so that in and of itself helps that side of the equation. Um, and, and it would require, I guess, more, uh, more education on the fact that if an exchange like Gemini is offering a coin, they probably make available to the regulators the audit key. Yeah. Speaking less about exchanges and more So about, then it's not yeah. really Monero at that point. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I was speaking less about exchanges, more about the financial institutions that, you know, uh, would decide to accept, you know, Monero or Zcash. That's, yeah. Fair. And, and currently we have no explicit prohibition um, in our laws or regulations that I'm aware of against privacy coins. Uh, we have a question in the back, Rodney. Yeah, just to continue on this point, um, uh, Bitcoin uh, protocol development itself seems to be evolving towards strong privacy. Schnorr signatures, Taproot, even Lightning Network has privacy implications. So I'm just trying to understand <clears throat> chain analysis. Like, um, is, it, is, it, is it just an arms race? Or 
do we get to a point where chain analysis just stops working? What, uh, what, what's your comment on that? <laughs> so I have some pretty strong feelings that I'm gonna try to keep at bay here. Um, Listen, if you, if you read the Bitcoin white paper, it's, it's not a privacy coin. It, I think the word privacy is mentioned one time. Um, people that want to do nefarious things are not going to use Bitcoin. The reason they do now is because the regulatory landscape is gray, and it's been gray for the last 10 or 11 years. So um, I would say that there's a mistake when we clump all cryptocurrencies together. Um, my expectation <clears throat> is, you know, sometimes I think some people in the room here are more advanced than some people that work in governments and, you know, people that work at regulatory organizations because I talk to people all the time that don't know that these capabilities are out there. And that's why banks, governments, regulators have been so apprehensive to discuss cryptocurrencies. And they think that they're all synonymous or they're all anonymous and they don't want to deal with any of them. The distinctions between them are very real. And I think, you know, in talking about privacy coins versus, let's say, Bitcoin, I think what you're going to see is adoption in the Bitcoin space by regulated entities and privacy coins, because they are very, very difficult problems to solve, are going to be the places where bad people go to do bad things for the interim until we figure those out. I think if I could add to, um, I think basically on that point, the onus just kind of becomes on the, the entity itself who is integrating its uh, offering or services uh, in this industry. Um, and, and you will always find companies that prefer to operate offshore and outside of the jurisdiction of uh, specific regulators, and they do just fine with that. There's a lot of poker companies and gambling companies that are uh, registered in the same jurisdiction that a lot of the big exchanges in the world are going to, uh, simply because of their position on sort of high-risk businesses and things like that. Um, and and I think, I think what uh, sort of the, the free market aspect of, um, you know, good companies that are willing to take the the proper legal positions on the matter and they're not trying to hide anything and they're not trying to learn and they're trying to educate and be compliant i think that will um you know basically create two segments of where you can go and interact with cryptocurrency and blockchain you will have an illicit dark market and you will have a clean uh, sanctioned and regulated environment as well yeah, and uh, what I might add is, you know, it's it's easy to think of these tools sometimes as sort of a, a silver bullet solution. They're, they're excellent. A lot of them are very good. Um, I like to just sort of describe them as sort of one tool in the toolbox from a from a you know security from a AML perspective. So you know whether or not chain analysis becomes an arms race, it may it may not. Um, you know, it it goes back to sort of in some respects good old fashioned you know AML techniques that are combined with these sorts of tools and the capability that they, that they bring you know all the while those tools will be um, catching up to the criminals and where they're going um, but combined with sort of doing all the right things from an AML perspective and you know knowing your customer transaction monitoring you know that's I think where where we'll see this go in the short term and if I just want to add one more thing, sorry. Um, so I, I can, if I can just leave this point with this, um, you know, I remember an, an, an era in running a, a Bitcoin exchange where I didn't have a great uh, suite of these tools. And the moment I started turning some of them on, uh, boy, did my eyebrows raise. Um, because it's amazing how much you really don't know uh, until you're able to um, have somebody or something show you something you can't see. And, uh, you know, that changes sort of a lot of, you know, what our MO is at BitBuy. Um, it kind of... It kind of freaked me out a little bit that I can see the, all the, the, the nature of risk associated with X percentage of coins flowing in and out of BitBuy. Um, and, and one particular example that's interesting, in, in most jurisdictions around the world, gambling is sort of a high risk, uh, you know, forbidden or banned thing. In the United States, you can't do sports betting or, or anything like that yet. Uh, and it's coming state by state. But in Canada, for example, it's fully legal to be sports betting and betting it online and things like that. So uh, the tools that we use definitely flag gambling sites as high risk. Um, so then it's up to us to look at other indicators associated with this particular account and transaction to determine whether or not this is 
uh, what we believe nefarious activity. Um, so just because it was flagged as high risk and it's going to a gambling site, um, you know, if everything checks out on the KYC side and I've got X, Y, Z recourse proof and remediation in the event something goes wrong, then, you know, for all intents and purposes, anybody in this room can do whatever they want with whatever they own um, to a degree. Um, and, and that would be a degree that would be allowed. Yeah, I will definitely say as a former banker, the first time that I saw a visualization of just here's what an investigation looks like on the blockchain, here's what the data looks like, it was shocking to me just in, in terms of the amount of data um, that was available that you could see, that you could analyze. Now, it still takes a very skilled analyst, I think, to draw conclusions from that data and to make sense of it, um, but it, it was absolutely incredible to me. And I, I want to go back to the question just for a second of privacy. So Giles, if I had to do, if I had to, you know, I have someone who needs a forensic investigation, you're one of the folks that I would call. Um, what are the things that, that worry you from a privacy perspective? Or what are the things that um, when your investigation hits a point, that's what's made it more difficult? Yeah, well, I think you know a lot of these, uh, a lot of these risks are still pretty unique in the crypto space. Um, you know, we're still learning how to um, track and trace, and learning what suspicious activity looks like in a crypto environment. It's still developing day by day. I'm learning every day. So, you know, from a traditional forensic perspective, you know, if we're investigating someone and. The challenge is how do you make that leap from the fiat, the regular world, into the crypto environment? And okay, you might know that um, you know someone has, let's say, bought a gun on the dark market and then transferred or sold some drugs on the dark market, transfer those funds into a privacy coin, and then all of a sudden it goes dark. So that sort of that keeps us forensic folks up at night because you know what do you do with that? What can you do with all that information? And, and sort of you know that there's something there, but you can't take it any further. So uh, from my perspective. You know, that's, I think, one of the next big leaps for the tools like this is venturing into that sort of privacy uh, realm and giving kind of shining light, you know, pardon the pun, into that area. Um, so, but, you know, for sure in sort of some of the more popular coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, these tools have already proven enormous value in terms of tracking and tracing criminal activity, you know, further down the line, even linking to identities. We've been in a couple of cases, not through the tool specifically, but the intelligence that the tool has given has allowed us to piece together a puzzle which we other wouldn't have otherwise would not have been able to do. Um, and you know that was almost un that was unfounded even a couple of years ago. So it's very exciting, but there's also big challenges which I think these tools um, uh, hopefully will will start to address in the next couple of years. Thank you. And I think the gentleman in white had a question. Yeah, This makes it impossible to catch the fraudsters. No, <laughs> no, not at all. And so um, the investigation point. Yeah. So when I when I said gray area, I just mean um, you know, lots of jurisdictions haven't made up their mind about how they want to treat. Bitcoin ATMs, Bitcoin, is it an asset, is it a this, is it a that? So those are the types of concerns um, when I'm talking about a regulatory gray area, that's what I mean. The question related to, um, you know, our, like our essentially our bad guys getting caught, yeah, I mean, one of the cases that we worked on um, with Giles's team is it's the largest Bitcoin forfeiture in Canada, right? So, so as you, you kind of said, someone tried to purchase a handgun off the dark market, they ended up buying it from the Department of Homeland Security. They called the Firearms Enforcement Unit in Canada. He was arrested. He had a bunch of drugs in his place. He also had 288 bitcoins. So what had happened in that case was the Crown Attorney used our software. She worked with GT, and they they basically showed that the majority of the defendant's accounts were funded by dark market activity. It was a, a really easy case for us to work on. Um, in another circumstance, there was a person in... Um, uh, San Francisco, who had actually sent in some Bitcoin to a Syrian terrorist organization. He was picked up by police because he did it from his um, Coinbase account. Coinbase is compliant, they collect KYC information, they're domiciled in uh, the US, and so you know that's how bad guys are caught, is when they're doing bad things I and not being smart I remember getting email. <laughs> yes, so bad guys are getting caught. <laughs> Good, okay. Beautiful. Um, we have a question up in the front. So a question that's still on a number of people's minds is, so far, 
not much has been recovered on the crypto side from Quadriga. There has been fake accounts that were funded with fake dollars and then money was sent out to other exchanges. Can you guys comment on how chain analysis tools can help recover or find or figure out what happened to it considering that it got sent to multiple exchanges potentially in other jurisdictions and sort of what needs to be brought into play in addition to chain analysis tools to help tra track it down if possible. I just want to interject uh, before we get onto the forensic side of that. Um, I think one thing uh, that is starting to be prominent amongst m many of the top exchanges in the world um, is we're all in constant communication with each other and we've realized that we can uh, reach out and ask uh, other entities um, in order to assist us with a particular transaction flow. Um, and. Uh, in a lot of cases, that communication line uh, between the exchange operators themselves has found and has caught uh, and has been able to recover in some instances um, certain coins and certain crypto just based on uh, open lines of communication and the fact that there's a large group of these entities that, that want to fight these guys, that want to catch people who are trying to give crypto a bad name. I'm not going to touch Quadriga at the no, moment. No, no, no. Right now. <laughs> but because of that, so the privacy is a big concern, right? So if it's in, under Quadriga's name, fine. But if it got opened under Joe Below or whatever, right, they don't know if it was actually Joe or if it was Quadriga. So then, like, issues come into play there around, like, an exchange maybe not wanting to... Qu I, I don't know, but that's kind of... And, and that's some of the concern that the, the CSA and the IROC have uh, as well um, is is you know a lot of these exchanges they have hot and cold wallets and you have x percentage in your cold and x percentage of hot and they all belong to your customers but if there isn't an actual legal uh, paper trail that establishes a specific right to somebody um, then just like you asked how how, how does uh, how does Magdalena's balance that show on Bitcoin um, reflect how many I have in the cold basket and how many I have in the hot basket? And let's say for the purposes of a bankruptcy or a liquidation sale, if those records don't exist, then that's fair game for creditors. Um, and so I think that that's a huge concern that the, reg that the regulators want to uh, address, and that's something that uh, you know we're all we're all um, hoping to satisfy and work with them to solve. But back to the tracing, can you guys help? <laughs> so, so what happens? Um, something's gone wrong. Uh, something's gone wrong. Coins, coins are missing. Um, you know what address they're missing from. Um, what happens then? So, um, so generally the protocol when, whether it's a client of ours or a big exchange that let's say we're not even working with, when there's a hack or there's something big that happens like this and their cold storage addresses are published, our team is on it. Like we're on it, we're monitoring it and, and we're not the only ones. Like everybody in this space, this is our bread and butter. So um, in terms of being able to, like I'm not gonna speak specifically about Quadriga because it's, it's still an open case. Um, but the whole idea, I mean, when, so let's say you steal 500 million Bitcoin and you know that the whole world or there's a subset of people in the world that can actually see what you're doing, that makes you very apprehensive towards moving that Bitcoin. Um, so, I mean, I think the one thing is just, I, I don't know if a scare tactic is the word. It's, it's actually a real thing. We're watching what they're doing because that's what the technology enables us to do in terms of recovery that's gonna be on a case by case basis, right? Um, let's say I stole 500 million Bitcoin and I wanna give it to one of my two friends and we're just gonna use our phones and our hot wallets. We're not gonna use um, an exchange to do that. There's nothing to say that that's not possible, right? The, the thing that I think is important um, as it relates to Quadriga is uh, there, people wouldn't be getting hurt and wouldn't be losing money if they would just take a little bit of time to educate themselves. You should not leave large sums of money on a cryptocurrency exchange that has access to private keys. That is a big no-no. So um, do some reading, figure out where you should put your Bitcoin, use the, the trading platforms as trading platforms. Um, and then we wouldn't have these problems. Um, I think a lot of people are mad at Quadriga, they're mad at the government, they're mad at everybody, but I, I think that we can also look internally and figure out where are consumers liable for essentially gambling, because that's what you're doing at that point. No, no, but, but I get it, but we are in that situation. Sorry, just, no, just, no, just want to get the question of yeah. like how, but we're stuck. Like, 
I'm I'm on the quadriga, like I'm an inspector for the trustee. So for the bankruptcy and assume, like we're still just to, to see what EY comes up with. But let's just assume worst case is, you know, there's many jurisdictions. Like how can chain analysis help try to recover or can it even or what are the limitations? Like I'd like to understand as an inspector, what can we do? Yeah, and, and maybe what I would do is encourage us to take the conversation offline. I'm sure the two of us could run some traces and, and kind of show you what we can do. I think EY has a proprietary technology. I don't know the specifics of what they do or how it compares to what we do or our competitors do. So again, it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Hello. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think we can probably help. It just It's going to depend on what things look like. Sorry, I know it's not probably yeah. exactly the answer you want, but that's kind of the reality. I think too, like a, a specific example, like let's say uh, you know, hundred million dollars of it went to uh, an exchange in Germany that happened to be registered uh, and kept records on the person who liquidated such assets. Then there may be a chance there when, when uh, on one side of the transaction you can present to the law enforcement agency or regulator or entity on the other side, hey, I have all this information. Uh, that's what we, that's what I was kind of alluding to with sort of the channels of communication that are open between some of the top exchanges. Um, so, you know, just not to get into too many details, but I did have a customer uh, a couple of weeks ago who got fished by somebody claiming to be a bit by employee. And sure enough, this guy gave him full access to the account, even though we have pinups on the site that say no bit by employee will ever ask you for a password because I can just reset your password. Um, that, that was a weak joke. Um, but basically, um, you know, there's there's a lot, this alludes back to what Dina was saying, there's a lot of education that's required uh, in order to interact with something uh, as, as, as advanced as this blockchain technology is. Um, and there's a proper way to use it and there's an improper way to use it. And I think the lack of education always and every time will highlight the improper way to use it that results in theft, loss of coins, and situations like Quadriga. So I, I absolutely respect um, what you and what Dina are saying. I, I think education is incredibly important. Um, if you are not sure where to go for Bitcoin education, so if you're at that point where you're like, hey, I'd like some Bitcoin, I'm not really sure what a wallet or a private key is or how to use it, Rodney, can you wave? Uh, Rodney has some copies of the Bitcoin white paper um, in analog on paper. Um, and in the back of those, there, is, there are actually a number of different resources. Um, I'm, I'm relatively sure that anyone that's sitting up here would also happily talk to you a little bit about security um, and that Magdalena and a couple of other folks here would be willing to do that as well. Um, if you're not sure what it means to secure a wallet, um, to hold your own private keys, very, very happy to have those conversations because I think they're important. We concur. Um, we do. Tangentially related to the question, although not specific to Quadriga, I'm always less concerned about the scammers and more concerned about the people who've actually been scammed. So if I'm in that situation where I've been a victim of ransomware, uh, where I've been fished, where now the Bitcoin has left my wallet um, and I want to do something about it, what are the steps that I should be taking to make sure that you can help me? Education, education, education. Um, so uh, I was reading a very lengthy, maybe eight minute read medium article this morning about a guy who lost 100,000 worth of Bitcoin because he was SIM swapped. And he, in, in plain detail with charts and diagrams, like this guy is in so much denial right now, but he laid out how he was feeling, every interaction, everything, and then shared this with the world uh, and it's it's been read over five or ten thousand times since it, it's come out already and I think uh, I know that's not really the answer you're looking for but I think um, you know just like anything when something bad happens to you, you go, oh my god I can't believe this happened how did this happen to me but then eventually you figure out why and you're probably the best person to never let that happen to you again given how seriously you may want to take this particular instance and based on what I read this guy will never be sim swapped again and he will never not secure his private keys offline in cold storage um, and those are his own words um, and, and I think had he taken such approach or such caution prior to this event, 
um, then maybe he could have protected himself. Although the SIM swapping example is, is pretty hard and um, that's really a non-crypto attack vector uh, as to which someone can gain control over your stuff. Um, so be careful from those unknown numbers that begin to ask you to record your voice online because that's basically the gist of it. Yeah. Yeah, like, uh, you know, this, the, uh, I have a number that calls me every other week. They claim to be a duct cleaning service, and they're all, I never say the first word, and they always say to me, is this Adam Goldman? And they want to record me saying yes, and then eventually they want to build uh, a script of my voice in order to authenticate against wow. an account change. And so it's very clever, and there's a lot of other non-crypto attack vectors that you'd have to watch out for. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. It's back. I think that, uh, uh, to, that was my stab. Unfortunately, in, in this hypothetical, we're past the education. You've been hacked or you've been scammed. Um, my answer to you would just be to give us a call a firm like any of ours and give us any information you're willing to divulge. Um, your address, your Bitcoin address, and the transaction hash, and we'll go from there. Um, uh, and any kind of information that you have about the scammer, uh, if you could forward their whatever communication they sent to you, we would we would definitely be able to use that. Um, Do I need an incident number from the police before I contact you? Nope. No. No. Oh. So I so I can just get in touch directly. We would absolutely uh, recommend you also be in contact of with course. local police. I was um, going to say, as a best practice, you should probably call the police. But anyone on the panel would be willing to help because we have these these technologies at our fingerprints. So, so back to uh, the exam. I didn't finish what I was saying about the a gentleman who got fished. No, that's okay. I dove off into another subject. Um, uh, so we have a, we're, we're very close with certain uh, forensic investigators and things like that as well. And we managed to, uh, after the customer had given us some more um, data points about, you know, where did this go? What did he say? What email? Um, just by gathering the original email header that the guy um, was fished, we were able to ter determine some weaknesses in our DNS protocol. And so he was able to pass off looking like a legit bit by email. That's no longer the case. Um, but then further, these investigators were actually able to find this gentleman and maybe get back about five or 10 percent of what he stole, and I thought that was very impressive. Um, and maybe that might be a continuing trend given the ineptness of, of criminals in general who are, you know, doing theft under 5,000 petty amounts and things like that. Um, they, they usually don't have the technical prowess um, to use it in, in a way that you may be able to remain anonymous. And, uh, you know, Dina made the point earlier, uh, if, if criminals really want to uh, do something, they probably at this point wouldn't use Bitcoin. Um, just given how old the chain is, how many tools exist, how much information has been gathered, and how many data points are out there for us to check. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, and it goes back, I guess, to the, the conversation of attribution to some degree. Um, you know, tools like Cybertrace, you know, we're even starting to see things like IP addresses being associated with different wallet addresses. And we actually had a case um, not directly related to cryptocurrency, but sort of still in the digital realm where um, we actually knew the IP address of a, a ransomware perpetrator um, tracked down roughly to the location of their, their property. And then, you know, in true sort of CSI style, went around looking for the IP ping with a sort of one of those satellite looking things and found the actual person in conjunction with law enforcement. So it goes, it goes down to, um, uh, that's not going to be the case all the time, right? So again, it goes back to attribution, and, and but these tools can certainly give you a start and you know take you down a road which can potentially sometimes lead you to um, to recovery, but not all the time. Fair. So so then I think for for anyone who's been a victim, um, the message there is don't keep it a secret. Um, get in touch, contribute, and be part of totally. those investigations. I think we have a, a question over here, and then we'll come to you, Joseph. Um, I have actually two questions. Um, the first one for the IP. Uh, most of the um, illicit activities taking place over VPN. Um, was there any instances where um, any of you guys know or um, directly dealt with VPN providers who can help? Um, or can they help? Let's put it this way. Um, But uh, generally speaking, when you are um, um, 
stole some money, you kind of keep it secret, like you don't move it, like you said, because everybody's looking for you. Um, if you want to reverse engineer it and look for previous hacks or stolen money, how long does it take for the person or the criminal to move the funds? How, how long does it uh, take, for, um, does the activity become uh, dormant before they actually move again? Thank you. Uh, that's going to be case by case. Some there's some accounts that have stolen Bitcoin that haven't moved in years, you know. So, again, it, like I wish there was a canned answer for all of these really good questions. It's just, um, yeah, it's just it's it's hard to give a, a general answer. It's going to depend on a case by case basis. I would just add that um, with respect to your question about the VPN providers, I would say also case by case basis, but more specifically, um, if the VPN providers themselves are operating in, you know, uh, Western world jurisdictions, they traditionally comply with a lot of uh, international regulatory bodies, or at least um, try to in order to participate in the Western economies. And so, you know, given the correct law enforcement path and potentially a court order, it may be possible. Um, they may have the keys to their tunnel. They may have the ability to um, decrypt information that traveled over their tunnels. Um, I would imagine they probably do. Um, and uh, I think it would still be very tough, just given the nature of how uh, VPN providers are set up. Um, you talk about saying, okay, uh, if, if I've been hacked and somebody stole my crypto, contact one of you guys. Um, that's great. I guess you're doing it for benevolent reasons, or is there a cost to that, number one? And then number two, how do you verify that it was me being hacked and I'm not just doing some sort of investigation on somebody else? I think, um, I think the cost in, in my particular um, business segment, uh, I think it's worth it to spend as much time as possible to help such a person and not for the reasons of benevolence, but earlier alluding to sort of the educational aspect of it, that's typically the, how the conversation goes after somebody's been a victim, is we kind of walk through the whole process and usually we get to a point where we can identify sort of the um, the element or action that was taken that was where uh, the hack occurred, if you will, right? And so, um, you know, the customer that got fished at Bitbuy, um, you know, if had he been maybe uh, more uh, experienced in using traditional online platforms, not even crypto exchanges, but like even Facebook, um, you know, no Facebook employee is going to ask you for your password. Usually no support staff at banks, telcos, anything that's, that's already the norm now. And so I think, um, you know, when, when he kind of hit that on the head, um, you know, and he told us that he had given this person his password to his account it's like it's it's giving somebody the the key to your front door um and uh there's only so much we can do uh, at that point um i know joseph doesn't like that answer any any other commentary there just just in terms of cost and um or or i guess more aptly at what point would there be a cost Sure, yeah, the, we always start with, uh, like I said, if there's been an incident, we ask for you know a transaction hash or, or a Bitcoin address, and we kind of do a pl preliminary um, look at the case for free, and that's kind of our, our SOP. And um, we, if it's a, a quick one shot, yeah, they stole your stuff and it went to Coinbase, um, reach out to them, and that, that's usually at no cost. But when there's mixers involved when there's, you know, a large scale hack uh, and there's there's many hops, then, um, I mean, we're using our, our software and developers time, um, so we will uh, give a quote, but um, it, we're always happy to initially look at a case and, and let you know how big it is, uh, how sophisticated uh, they're dealing with. Sometimes it's, uh, say there's 100 Bitcoins and then immediately it's broken into like two Bitcoins a piece and then you're dealing with a, a serious actor and, and it's going to be a big case. Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat? Sorry, it's the second part of the question. How do you deal with the confirmation that it's the person that got hacked and not somebody trying to... Um, perpetrate some other type of intelligence? So so you and I dated, we broke up, I know you have Bitcoin, I call your exchange and say, 
Um, yeah. You know, I, I've been hacked and this Bitcoin was transferred to you. Um, I, I'm going to take a swing at, at that and then, and then head it over to you guys. But I, I think one of the things that happens in that case is that most of the time um, your exchange isn't going to freeze something or hand it over um, unless they really have some kind of appropriate evidence. So when I was talking about that number from the police, I think before there was ever a case where an exchange would say, um, we're going to give this to a third party, they'd really want there to be a police investigation. They would want there to be um, a appropriate due process. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I hope I'm not. Giles, did you want to did you want to comment on that one? I know. I think the the comment around due process, I think is you know it is case by case. It's not going to be um, there's not a blanket answer to the whole thing. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I guess if for example if you're verified um, on an exchange, you know, then that's sort of you know you, there's ways that you can prove then therefore that you're you know logging onto your own account and you know this was the one that got hacked and. Um, yeah, it becomes more difficult, I guess, when you get out of that realm. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's tricky. It's case by case. I think. I think I think also in general, just sort of continuing to expand and beef up your your tool suite will give you a better uh, ability to do that uh, and and sort of make sure that who you're dealing with is. I mean, there's. Uh, I call, I'm, I'm with uh, Bell for my cell phone, and I know that Rogers, the competitor, has actually implemented a voice synthesis security, so um, you can't just call it, if you're, this, if you're a son, you can't call in on your dad's account and go, hey, like, add this service or anything like that, but I think, obviously, um, there's a much more nefarious reason for wanting to do that, and I called Bell and I said, hey, I'm concerned with XYZ, phishing, et cetera, this and that. Do you have this competitive pr uh, competing feature that I could enable? No, we don't have it yet. And you know that was sort of the end of that, but I mean, that's just sort of proof that uh, adding additional tools to um, capture different data points and lock things down, things like two-factor two authentication, multi-signature, multi-sign-off on you know, non-technological processes can help you uh, make sure that uh, <laughs> what you're trying to look at as accurate is, is that accurate. Yeah, and maybe just one more comment on the privacy aspect. So, I mean, it's it's blockchain we're dealing with. So if you somehow own the keys because your ex-boyfriend gave them to you, yeah, then right. you're now the, the rightful owner of that account and what's in it, right? So I think just to reiterate that point, like be careful uh, if you have Bitcoin or other assets, make sure that you are the sole owner of those keys. Right, it's, and, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, if it's not your private keys, it's not your Bitcoin. And uh, and and so a lot of a lot of us are kind of uh, you know as we allude to keeping your coins off exchange and secured properly in proper wallets. Um, one of the favorite uh, m methods today is to use a hardware wallet. Um, and while that's all great, it's using a hardware security module. It's uh, in, in, in an encrypted uh, container on a little device that's holding the important information. Um, I think. Uh, you still have to be educated where you go, oh, okay, I'm gonna get some Bitcoin, I'm gonna buy a hardware wallet, I'll just go on eBay and buy this hardware wallet. Well, you may just uh, have made yourself victim to a supply chain attack where this device was opened up before it got to you and the device was already signed or already seeded. And we've, then we've seen that, this is a real thing. Exactly. Yeah, any, anything that comes that's a hardware device that already has a private key associated with it, um, please don't use that private key. <laughs> That's that's a that's a it's I mean I mean you laugh but this is a scam that's actually um, caused a number of people to lose their cryptocurrency is that the device will arrive um, and somebody's opened it and then resealed it and they've put in a nice slip of paper that says hey we've set up this device in advance for you super easy here's the information associated with this device don't reset it um, just go ahead and use this information that's, also that's here right now great at making fake copies today too like there are are l very good looking fakes of both ledger and trezor hardware wallets that you can get um, and you know when you analyze two of these boxes next to each other you can start to see different things in the font and in the hologram used and the placement of certain yeah. text and the average person doesn't really know or pay attention to that um, but you know if, if you're getting a hardware wallet for $100 cheaper than the MSRP from the manufacturer, then like you're risking however many assets you may put on that device at some point. Yeah, and, and as much as I generally speaking actually have a deep love for Amazon, uh, don't buy a hardware wallet from Amazon. 
Um, there, there are a number of fakes that have been identified um, on Amazon by the hardware companies themselves and by authorized resellers. So if you're buying a Trezor wallet, buy it from Trezor, uh, buy it from an authorized Trezor reseller. If you're buying a Ledger wallet, buy it from Ledger or from an authorized reseller. Um, don't, don't buy it on Amazon, don't buy it from a rando on eBay, um, don't buy it from the dude on the corner. Yeah, it's really cheap until you lose all your Bitcoin and then it's really expensive. So, oh, I, I have a question. So in the past, I've lost a wallet. I've made a complaint to police. They did nothing. My brother has lost the car. It was stolen from the ghost station. They did nothing. What are the chances if I report my Bitcoin lost to police, even though I can prove that I know exactly where it has went, all those details, what are the chances or at what, what threshold they will start caring and working towards it? So I can... Um I can speak about the law enforcement organizations in Canada, and I can tell you that this is on their radar. I'm, I'm not going to promise you that if you call and say I lost $200 worth of Bitcoin that you're going to get someone showing up at your house, you're going to get all their attention. But um, a few years ago, these tools weren't av available to law enforcement communities, and so they were very limited in you know, in how they could help. Um, I think that will change over the next couple years. Uh, the RCMP is doing a lot, the OPP is doing a lot, um, the Toronto Police Service, like these guys are all, they're on this, they're getting requests um, and those requests are only increasing. Um, so I, I would say yeah, another case by case basis, but um, I think the future is looking bright in terms of um, you know the support that will be available to you. In my experience, it's important to File a police report first. Um, there was a case in, in the States that I helped out a, a few months ago where somebody reached out to their local uh, police department. They'd never heard of Bitcoin, but they filed a police report correctly. They reached out to us. They gave us all the information. And if we are able to point them in the right direction and say, this is where your Bitcoin, whatever coin you, you lost, went, take this to law enforcement. And then basically that gives them a, a way to serve legal process on those um, if it's a compliant entity. Um, just help them help police point in the right direction where to serve a subpoena. Um, because otherwise, like you said, if you just tell the cops, hey, I lost Bitcoin, help me, they're going to say no. Um, and education in terms of the law enforcement sector is very important. And, and having a good relationship with them as, as a software company is, is proving to be very helpful. Yeah, the, the tools are just now coming into existence for, um, you know, for, for, for the status quo to change. And, you know, companies like Big, companies like Grant Thornton and Cypher Trace, um, you know, they're the reasons why, if anything, in the future, things will be able to be done about it because they're providing us with the ability to make sense of uh, what the police and the law enforcement agencies could otherwise not make sense of. So, uh, the real question is, when I lost my wallet, it was, there were cameras, I knew exactly where I lost it. And uh, with the car, it was from Go Parking Station, so there were cameras as well. No one cared about checking those cameras. What are the chances that they would care about losing a Bitcoin wallet? So I'm trying to understand the threshold again. Like, is it 100,000? Is it 50,000? Is it 10,000? Is it someone's life at risk? What is the threshold that, that, that we can guess right now? I think I think if he had to guess, I would just place it under how law enforcement deals with traditional theft and crime um, at certain values and ranges. And and so you know, in the example that we gave with ransomware, they're pretty quick to price it at such a level where uh, if you call the police, they'll tell you, "Sorry, we can't really spend any resources on this to do anything for you." Call your lawyer, and the lawyer will just tell you, "Pay the ransom." if you want your files back, uh, because there's no other way. And, and your alternative would be to hire some, um, you know, fir recovery service firms and just hope that they have the ability to break uh, what's otherwise known as unbreakable um, crypto algorithms. Um, general crypt cryptography is, is pretty hard to break at the, at the level we use it today. At risk of sounding really cynical on that, um, I, I agree with you. Fraud is a major problem in Canada. Uh, we have a very low solve rate. We have a very low arrest rate. We have an abysmally low conviction rate. Um, and we have a police resourcing issue. And this is true from coast to coast to coast in this country. Um, but I have actually a lot more faith in certain things in this space than I do in the traditional space. Um, in that you're not entirely relying on the police force. And so what you're looking at 
is the tools that are provided by private industry. What you're looking at is the communication between exchanges. And so when Adam finds out, hey, this Bitcoin that just came into our exchange seems to have come from a ransomware attack, they have the ability to actually freeze any further transactions in that account, to do their own investigation, um, and to cooperate with the police in a way that essentially hands to the police on a silver platter, um, here's a conviction, and, and if you're not going to go for that, at least give us what we would need to get this back to the rightful owner. And I, th I think that's very different um, from just being reliant on police resources. You see these tremendous resources that are coming from private industry and private industry collaborations. And, and, and to further allude to the cipher trade uh, CypherTrace fentanyl case, I mean, it was CypherTrace's tools and technology that was submitted as evidence in a court of law, and so it passes that standard if it's able to be explained. Um, and I think we're moving much closer, and you know, if, if that happened today, Chinmay, then I think you'd have a much better chance just due to the general understanding of law enforcement yeah. than you know, four years ago. Um, I remember when I first, first ever got into Bitcoin, I wanted to sell Bitcoin, and so I would buy a little bit of Bitcoin, and I would sell Bitcoin on eBay and hope to get a payment. And sure enough, after 12 in a row, perfect sales, eBay goes, no, nope, these are all fraudulent transactions. I call Bitcoin, I call PayPal, hey, do you know blockchain transactions are not reversible? What the heck is blockchain? And so I was SOL on that. Um, but you know, now there's overtures that PayPal is gonna be accepting Bitcoin. So there's, an, there's a point in time where they have no idea and we move closer and closer as the industry evolves um, at being able to do something about it. And I think going forward, um, the status quo will change to uh, being able to do something about it. Because you know, one point I often make is there aren't even tools as good that exist in the blockchain space right now for traditional finance. The fact that I can use several tools to follow everything back to the beginning of time for a crypto transaction, that just doesn't exist on the SWIFT network or the EFT network or the ACH network or any of those rails. And so I think this, this element or space has the ability to redefine the sort of traditional technology mechanisms that our traditional fiat currencies and, and, and money wiring and movement services um, work. And if they start to go the blockchain model, then we could definitely start to have tools in the traditional space like you see being created now in the crypto space. Thank you. Um, in, terms of, in terms of these tools and where they're moving, um, for someone who wanted to learn more about them, for someone who was potentially interested in working in the field, what kind of skills are important? So what do I, what do I want? What courses do I want to take? I, I think what I've noticed is that um, the crypto industry is filled with professionals from all across other disciplines, right? So you've got people from uh, FinTech, you have pure programmers, you have math people, you have compliance people, you have payments people. Um, all the different uh, professional industries are beginning to um, overlap in sort of the crypto world. And I think, um, you know, that's sort of, uh, uh, that should just tell you that even though there, we've got to a point where there's courses like like what Big is teaching and things like that, and you get very deep into uh, crypto technologies, processes, how exchanges work, et cetera, um, that, um, oh, I just trailed off into oblivion. But basically, um, you know. There being a lot of different industries. Th yeah, there, there, there are so many different industries that overlap into this industry because when you look at cryptocurrencies, it's just a financial application of cryptocurrency. But then when you talk about non-financial applications of cryptocurrency, all those same minds can still cross over into the space. But traditionally, uh, 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 you know, I would say a, a traditional understanding of some, some basic macroeconomics, microeconomics coupled with uh, sort of the internet world that we live in today uh, and, and that we, we all live online and we're all five seconds away from uh, web communications, um, you know, that's a good start because all these courses and degrees are just being made now. Like when I got in, there was just, there was nothing. Um, as far as that. Now you could be a professional in a mathematics discipline and if you're building blockchain technology, um, that's probably sort of the best in that specific route. But I think the, the accounting people and the compliance people are gonna be the best people to overlap into crypto to solving those same problems, um, for sure. But I, but I think I kind of dove off as to 
um, you know, what you would at least want to know to start because we've now arrived at a point where Oxford teaches courses, Block Eaks teaches courses, Big is teaching courses. Princeton, University Princeton of Nicosia. University. Like, there's some good yeah. stuff out there. Yeah. And that's all fairly new within the last three to four years. Yeah, and, and I would say, I mean, um, bringing a certain level of business acumen to this industry is wonderful. Being able to work in sales capacities is wonderful. Um, but, you know, you can always tell when you, you're you talking to someone that really gets it versus someone that just, you know, talks the talk, walks the walk, but doesn't really understand why or how. So there are so many resources that are available that are free, two of which I mentioned. The University of Nicosia offers a free course. Um, I think it's called Intro to Digital Currencies. Princeton offers a fantastic course. You don't even have to do the technical stuff if you don't want to. Um, and I think that because this industry is so nascent, if you can equip yourself with a foundational understanding of how blockchains work, you are going to be a really, really powerful person in the next couple of years. So while I think the traditional business stuff is great, I, I think there it's very easy to carve out a niche for yourself in this space. Yeah, and uh, I, I sort of add, you know, these tools are designed and have been designed really well to be intuitive and to, you know, without uh, too much training, you can really look at one and sort of start to get value from it pretty quickly. Um, you know, it's important to understand, you know, as Dina's mentioned, the fundamentals, even, you know, what is a wallet, what is it an address? We've talked about clustering as a concept, which, you know, a lot of these tools are based on. Um, interesting, the, the mention of sort of the overlap with more traditional compliance fields, you know, there's a number of, free resources online. Um, there's a great article that was recently released um, by a couple of investigators from a well-known exchange around what they're seeing as the suspicious indicators in crypto. It's on ACAMS today. Um, you can look it up, it's free, it's available for everyone to look at. Um, so, you know, in addition to the fundamentals of how blockchain and cryptocurrency works, to the extent that you can start to understand you know, what suspicious activity looks like from a money laundering perspective, be it in regular fiat world or in crypto, um, that will really give you an edge when you start to look at some of these tools and what these tools can show. Um, because combining those two things and you can say, okay, you know, that's changed. I oh, know that looks like it might be structuring or, you know, all those common terms that we hear from a money laundering perspective do apply in, in crypto. So, um, so educate yourself from a traditional money laundering perspective as well. And there's a ton of resources out there to do that. My bosses would kill me if I didn't take this opportunity to say uh, CryptoInvestigatorTraining.com. We have a 25% off code for anybody who's at this meetup. Uh, and it's like I said, it goes from Bitcoin 101 uh, to you can skip all that if you want and just chop it up into um, forensics and investigations. So yeah, that's we're very proud of that course. I guess I will also add um, there's a great uh, company and website out there called BlockGeeks.com. Uh, which was founded by a good friend of mine. And um, basically they have everything from sort of high level paid for courses all the way down to free webinars and just simple how to guides. There's tons of content posted on there. And, and you know, the name of the game is basically continuing to educate yourself. This is a new industry and it's a new field. And, uh, you know, my, I didn't mention my background at the beginning, but my background is, is as a computer analyst. I was basically a you know, glorified IT guy uh, in my teens into my early 20s, and I worked at Yahoo for a little bit, and then I worked at, in the web hosting space. And I think my understanding of network technologies and, and sort of the basic, um, you know, understanding of how technology has actually changed the world decade after decade um, led, me to, led me to just identify that it, it would be as disruptive as it's become. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, there, there really isn't such a particular base that you should have at this time, other than teaching yourself as much as you can, because, you know, I mean, who here watches YouTube videos to learn things? I, I think probably a lot, uh, from cooking to fixing light switches to plumbing to f replacing hard drives, you name it. And, and I think uh, um, the fact that we have access to such information at our fingertips helps this industry move so much quicker. And even only after 10 years, there's private entities offering these AML tools, these compliance tools, these forensic tracking tools that not even the traditional banks could figure out if you paid them a billion dollars. Um, and so um, just learning is the name of the game. All those resources that were mentioned, um, those are the best places to begin. Beautiful. I think we had another question in the audience. Yes. Uh, yeah, I had a question for Dina. Um, you mentioned crypto risk. And as somebody without an anti-money laundering background, can you um, explain that as uh, it relates to the bank? 
Yeah, what was the concept, sorry? Uh, you said there is a bank that had $1 billion in crypto. Oh, in exposure, yeah. So um, so the, the general idea there is um, sometimes when banks are looking for things, they've got, let's say, keyword searches. Um, so one time, I'll give you an example. I went to TD Bank. I was trying to buy Bitcoin, and I had to do a wire on Quadriga. And the subsidiary bank uh, was called HK Valoris. And the teller looked at me, and this was early on, mind you, so I was like, no one knows what I'm doing. The teller looked at me and he said, are you sending Bitcoin somewhere? And I was like, are you even allowed to ask me that? <laughs> so um, so these are the, the types of um, search words, I guess, keywords that banks will, it, it's kind of like what they do to monitor their networks. So our threat intelligence, it's basically like a data feed that we provide to them on a monthly basis. So. The important story with that bank in the U.S. is banks have been very hands-off, at least in Canada up until very, very recently. They've been very apprehensive about this space. And um, it's because they're thinking, we don't do crypto. Our, our clients are definitely not doing crypto. What the threat intel shows them is that at some point, there's got to be this on-ramp of fiat. You can't just you make crypto out of nothing, right? You usually have to buy it or mine it. Um, and so the threat intel is basically a feed that they can run against the searches that they traditionally do that shows them um, it's a much wider exposure net uh, usually. So that's kind of the gist of, of what it what it is, what it does. But if you wanna take a, a closer look, um, we, can, we can do that offline. And we're getting on time-wise, so, so I'm going to ask you guys one last question, um, if I may, and then we'll hand it over for a couple more audience questions if we have time. Um, in terms of misconceptions, and I, and I think your lead into that was really good, just in terms of, you know, our customers aren't, aren't using crypto. What are some of the common misconceptions that you've heard, either about blockchain analysis or about cryptocurrency generally? And then if you're going to hit us with a misconception, hit us with the right information as well. Uh, uh, I think the biggest mis misconception that we hear is that we're out to de-anonymize uh, de the network, and that's just not true. Another misconception is that we're, we're trying to just data mine and get all the information we can, and to an extent we are, but, but we're a very pro-cryptocurrency organization, pro-Bitcoin, so we're not just trying to say, got you, like we know who you are. No, we're, we're trying to provide the tools necessary for um, traditional um, banking and, and compliance institutions to create the reporting necessary to come into the space. So we're not just trying to de-anonymize, we're trying to make uh, Bitcoin more accessible to more people. So I think uh, my favorite misconception, um, just being in the exchange space, is that cryptocurrencies are anonymous. Um, clearly, after listening to us sit up here and talk on this panel, um, they're really not, uh, they can be, depending on how they're used. Um, certain blockchains themselves do provide that. Um, albeit with certain back doors that may allow for some recourse, like an audit key. Um, but basically, um, it's not anonymous, and especially when you know you take BitBuy, for example, which is a Canadian company that's a, a legal company that has um, processes, policies, and procedures in place to try to address the broad swath of things that either con customers would be concerned about or regulators would be concerned about. Um, and and anywhere a legitimate company like us is is providing such such services like exchange services, creating that on and off ramp. I mean, we're the ones creating the paper trail. And so um, you know, to, you know, that's why Dina goes back to that um, example as you know, criminals really won't be using Bitcoin at this point because you have to buy it or you have to mine it. In order to mine it, you need to buy stuff. And so you're still touching the fiat payment world. And any time you interact with a reputable business that follows the rules and follows the laws, I mean, we've got we've got the connection made. And um, you know, of course, there are privacy uh, rights and laws, et cetera. Um, but that doesn't put you above the law just because you're using Bitcoin. Uh, and I've always found that funny, actually, since the very beginning, that a lot of people go, "Oh, I'll just use Bitcoin to act nefariously," but. After listening to us talk, you can see that that's probably your worst option would be to use cryptocurrency, um, just given where this industry's headed and the type of tools that we have at this infant stage. Uh, another five to ten years from now, I couldn't. I, Pandora's box has been opened with how this is going to rev revolutionize both crypto itself and traditional finance. It's already happening. 
Hmm. Which misconception do I like the most? There are a lot. Uh, there's some good ones that, that were mentioned already. So yeah, Bitcoin's not anonymous or, um, yeah, it's, it's not. So there's the hut. We already talked about that pretty extensively. Um, something that was mentioned already was, uh, we are going against the ethos of what this was all meant to be by profiling transactions. Again, that's not at all what we're trying to do. Companies like ours are trying to make this economy safe. We want more people to have access to financial systems and they can do that through this technology. So that's that's another uh, really important misconception. And then I think one that um, I hear some bank executives have said in the past, Bitcoin is not something that is used by criminals. It is in some circumstances, but th to say like that's all it is, it's all criminals and drug dealers and people, you know, looking at bad things on the internet, that's not, that's not what this is, right? There are a lot of good people um, in lots of parts of the world that use this as a way to transact value every day. There are people who uh, live in places where governments can literally show up at their home and seize their property. And they think Bitcoin is a good place to store value and build uh, for the future. So um, I think that's probably where I'll settle on some of the misconceptions that I like. Okay, so I gotta try and figure out what, what's left. Uh, yeah. Still has the number one spot for sure. Yeah, still. I remember I, I put together once uh, an article uh, where I was trying to measure sort of the total market cap of the world's economies, which is kind of impossible, versus the market cap of, of cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, and then take the percentage threshold that's known in the traditional economies as to what is money laundering or terrorist financing, et cetera, and then just take that same percentage ratio and apply it over the numbers that I get from Bitcoin at the time. And it, it didn't even make up like 0.00001% of how much of the fiat crime is. And so for the the huffing and puffing and all the noise about how bad this is, I mean, the numbers are just not in, in favor of that argument. Um, and, and again, I mean, the majority of people who are using cryptocurrencies are interested in using it, um, you know, for, for the utility that, that it provides and potentially uh, as a speculative investment. I'm not giving any investment advice. Um, but you know, the, the majority is that. The majority is not the nefarious actors, just like in the traditional economy. But that, and that's one of those things that in AML we, we don't like to talk to, but I think that's a very astute point, that the international currency of crime is generally US dollars. Um, and it will be that for the foreseeable future because criminals want the same kind of money that everyone else does. They want something that's stable. They want something that's widely accepted. U US dollar was the worst ICO in history. No cap. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that and go back. Sure. To you. I, I so a I'll. Um, I guess for anyone who's who's considering purchasing one of these tools, um, I was talking to someone the other day that said to me, "Well, you know, don't all these tools do kind of the same thing?" And so the misconception there is, um, well, actually, kind of fundamentally, they provide an output whether it be a risk rating on a wallet or you know there are some other forensic style services that the tools provide. But the, the thing that's really important to understand is what goes into, for example, generating those risk ratings. We talked about attribution um, and even, you know, depending on what uh, coins that you're looking to uh, analyze, if you're an exchange, for example, certain platforms will provide analysis on certain coins, whereas others won't. Um, on the forensic side, without getting sort of too geeky with it, um, you know, as we, as a company, looked into which tools to utilize, one of the things that really stood out for us, um, for example, with CypherTrace, was the way that they collected the data and the way that it can be um, used, for example, in a court of law, which it has since been, and the way that that um, information is held in a forensically sound manner. You know, that's a very niche sort of um, thing to understand, but again, uh, that we didn't see that with all the tools. So the misconception of sort of don't these tools all do the same thing well fundamentally maybe but actually what goes into them is very different and depending on what your need is and what you're looking to get out of them um, you know you should un you should educate yourself on the type of questions that you need to ask those platforms and that will steer you one way or another and actually we quite often see platforms using multiple tools um, particularly from the risk assessment point of view because 
Um, you know, one wallet might be rated high risk on one platform, it might be rated medium risk on another. So particularly for some of the larger exchanges that we've worked with, um, they use a, a, a range of different tools to sort of help them get a spread on, on what that risk looks like. Uh, looks like. So, yeah. Do we have time for one more audience question? Do we have one more audience question? <laughs> it's definitely not Craig not Wright. Craig Wright. <laughs> Okay, so so Joseph has a question. And um, I have a question. So so one of the things I found with going through some of the investigations and things like that is um, insurance companies cover some of those aspects. If you're a business, um, do you, do you find have you found the same thing happening with personal insurance as well? Like wouldn't wouldn't crypto be treated like another type of asset that was stolen? I so talk to an adjuster. I I can comment on that um, just from my own experience of of insurance um, and even when we started taking payments in crypto when we started holding crypto um, as a company, I specifically had to set out to find an insurance company just for for us as outlier because we hold Bitcoin on our balance sheet. Um, and have a conversation and see how that would be covered um, or not covered. And I don't think that's easy. I, I think that the insurance industry is still struggling. I think that it's something that really came out in the recent CSA consultation, so the CSA IROC consultation, one of the things that they asked was, should Bitcoin companies, should cryptocurrency companies, um, you know, should companies that are dealing in broadly in virtual assets be required to have insurance? And in the industry consultations uh, that we did, it came out again and again and again that it was very expensive to insure, that it was really difficult to understand um, even what was being insured, so what was covered and what wasn't. Um, and it, it was almost impossible for exchanges and companies to get something that was, that was happening at a reasonable price. So, so I think that that's hard. Like, should it be insured? Probably. Is it? Eh. I, I think that we're going to have to have cases. I think. Um, it, I, I think guess my coming. question was a little bit more. Um, now that we're having better tools, have we contacted insurance to show them that these tools are viable to help them do that? Do the insurance? That's really, I think, what was more of my I question. Think, I think one of the best examples of that would be uh, the company BitGo that recently announced that Lloyd's of London was going to be offering a hundred million dollars worth of insurance. I didn't read into the granularity of that if it was for BitGo and what it's holding, or individually for certain customer accounts. Uh, but nonetheless, I believe what's happened in that particular example is the insurance company has gotten comfortable enough with the custody technology and mechanism that have been built at BitGo that would allow them to, to, to make such a decision. So I think, you know, um, a very strong implementation of proper private key management, accesses and controls and things like that, it's, it's certainly not impossible because, um, you know, crypto, te crypto technology would actually uh, allow for solutions to each one of the concerns that an insurance adjuster might have. And I think that's a, a good example of how it's starting to move the other way, just like, um, you know, with respect to how the compliance and forensic side of Bitcoin is helping uh, maybe change the attitude of law enforcement agencies and, and whatnot to, to, to go after um, and help a gentleman like Chin Mei who lost his wallet. Um, and, uh, you know, the same thing is happening in the insurance side. So they're getting more comfortable. And I think the best examples for that are the, um, the companies that are explicitly solving one specific problem in cryptocurrency and blockchain. So for a Bitco, it's they're the custody guys. Right. And and, you know, that may actually make the the CSA and IROC a lot more comfortable if an exchange operator like us wasn't taking on the custody infrastructure. But we used such a provider that has the insurance, the SOC 2 compliance, the whole nine as far as what would make everybody have that peace of mind. So this, this is actually probably a pretty good future panel topic. Um, the funny thing for me is that. I know one, maybe two insurance people that could speak to this intelligibly. So if you know some, please send them my way. Um, we're going to end off there. I want to say a big thank you, um, Giles, Dina, Adam, Andrew. Um, a huge thanks to Block Geeks for being here and filming. 
to Andrew for doing all of my wonderful organization um, and to the Professional Center for the Great Space. Um, have an awesome night, everyone. There, there are still sodas and snacks and coffee in the back, so feel free to grab some on your way out. <laughs>